The 2015 Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Hello everyone. Welcome to our talk about the Duolingo Incubator. And before I start, I want to ask um, who of you have heard of Duolingo before? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many of you have studied on Duolingo before? Very nice. How many of you are incubator volunteers who make courses? Wow, okay. Um, what languages? What language? Um, no, the, for the volunteers. Just want to know here quickly. Kai, yeah? German, Dutch. German, Dutch? What are the others? Yeah. Esperanto. Ah, good one. Okay. And the other way. Okay, I heard another one too, I think. Yiddish? Yeah. Nice. Vietnamese for English? Yeah. Vietnamese for English? Um, uh, Klingon for human speakers. Klingon? <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> so I'm the, I'm the uh, leader of the Esperanto team, Esperanto English team. And, um, yeah, and we're in phase one, which I'll explain later. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Luke. I'm in um, the Norwegian team. I've um, contributed for a few months at least, and we are also in phase one. Uh, hi, my name is Daniela. Uh, I'm from the German-English team, and both of our courses are in phase three. So I want to show you a quick video introducing Duolingo. from one person to another through a common language. Unfortunately, you can't communicate with others without knowing or learning their language first. A similar issue is manifested on the web, where text can be penned in dozens of languages, each of which demands a reader's fluency. We've developed an elegant solution to both problems, a way for you to learn a language for free, while at the same time helping to translate text from the web, enabling a wealth of language shackled information to be liberated for all of humanity. It's called Duolingo. Here's how it works. Let's say you're a native English speaker who wants to learn Spanish. We start by giving you a sentence from a Spanish website and asking you to translate it. Wait, back up. How can you translate a language you don't know? First, Duolingo only gives you sentences that fit your language level. Beginners get the really simple sentences from the web, and advanced users get the more complex ones. This way, everybody becomes a valuable translator. And second, if you're really lost, you can always seek possible translations for words you don't know. Afterwards, Duolingo helps you understand and memorize the words you hovered over through educational examples. You can also vote on the quality of other students' translations, which helps you learn by seeing how others translated the same sentence. And because you create valuable translations while you learn, we return the favor by offering Duolingo completely free of charge. No ads, no hidden fees, no subscriptions, just free. To put the potential benefit of Duolingo into perspective, think about this. If one million people would use Duolingo to learn, the entirety of English Wikipedia could be translated to Spanish in just 80 hours. Duolingo. Learn a language while translating the web. All right. So, um, Duolingo started in private beta in November 2011, and then uh, went for a pu public launch in June 2012. Another interesting fact is that uh, Bill Gates has used Duolingo some, which uh, is interesting to think about that the richest man in the world is learning the same as, um, say, uh, poorer people in South America, for example. Which Just, language? Hmm? <laughs> was it Spanish? It was okay. French. It was French. French. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> so I think it's very democratizing that um, the richest man in the world is using the same language, uh, the same tool for education as other people. It's amazing. So I want to show you quickly. Um, so if you go to learn, um, we offer these language courses on Duolingo. See, um, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Dutch. Yeah, the list keeps going on. And you also see the, the word, 
the courses that are currently being worked on, like Ukrainian, Norwegian, <laughs> Esperanto, and so forth. So when we um, have a course, you can also see the uh, description of it here. So we have a short description so people can get a feel. And here you see that um, over 21,000 people have signed up to uh, learn Esperanto when it comes out. They'll be notified then. 99% done creating the course. And you can also see the course contributors here, everyone who's contributed at least 2% toward the course. And this is all public. Which brings us into the incubator, which is where we um, actually make new languages. Well, we don't make new languages. We um, <laughs> make new courses for languages. And there, each language course is in um, three phases. So the first phase, we are actually working on the course. So the course is not yet released. You see Esperanto there. Spanish for Italian speakers, Polish for English speakers, Klingon for English speakers, Ukrainian, and so forth. And then the second phase is where we um, um, open it to the public for testing. And anyone can come in and say, like, this sentence is wrong. And um, Daniela will get into that much more in her um, session of what, of what those phases two and phases three are like. And when a course is considered uh, stable enough, it enters phase three. And then we say that the course is ready for general consumption by the public. Of those, we have 31 courses now currently in uh, phase three. So you might wonder, how do you become a course contributor? So um, we have um, three things we require of people who want to become a course contributor. It's to be bilingual. Let's, I don't know if you can read this. One. There we go. Oh, that's big now. OK. <laughs> so bilingual, uh, committed to, we say, it takes typically four or five hours a week, at least, of commitment to um, be a good contributor on a course. And to be passionate about languages, because if you think it's boring, I don't think it's gonna, you're going to be the best contributor, to be honest. <laughs> one thing nice as well is we have these uh, individual chat rooms that we use to, um, yeah, so flirting is done. <laughs> <laughs> so and you, this is where we can talk about um, uh, the different changes to the course. And yeah, Trang is here. Thanks for the help. She's in the audience somewhere. I think. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so. And uh, yeah, we have a global discussion where everyone can talk uh, announcements. So, saying we're having the Duolingo Incubator Summit here in, Berlin, here in Berlin yesterday. And you can also see that any of us can enter any chat room. So, I could even go into the Norwegian chat room right now. Say hi. So, <laughs> so here. <laughs> So this is the this is the best way to communicate, of course, when you're sitting next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> so it's main use. So to apply to be a course contributor, you enter your um, languages. Like if you want to teach Esperanto to Klingon speakers, for example, it's a very popular course, I think. Uh, and whether you're um, willing to moderate, so that means um, whether you're willing to get into the the details of say getting new course contributors and um, you know, there's not. And the new courses, there's not too big of a difference between moderators and uh, contributors, but there's just slight differences. Like, you just take more responsibility for the course, I would say. And then it asks you what's your native language. And then you quickly, oh, hopefully not quickly, you write in detail, great detail and perfect language of um, the, in, one, in both languages, why you think you have the skills, why you're qualified for the task of uh, working in the incubator along with your email address, username, and confirm that you're 13 years old. So, so it's quite simple, but... So when we enter the, our incubator course, this is almost the same thing that um, you'll see if you go, you can go to the incubator as well, even not being a contributor, and see at least the overview. We see it in a bit more detail. And this, this date is not correct for us, I have to say, for any of you looking at this. So, yeah, that what's holding back the Esperanto course right now is that we're actually getting a uh, um, real human recording of all the sentences in our course. So we're really incredibly impressed by that, and we're looking forward to that coming out. That's mostly what we're waiting on right now. And you can see how many 
words, so we've taught 1,888 words. That doesn't include form of words, right? That's um, no, every form is... Okay, so, so like every root you would say of a word is... So, and then all the different forms, so it's probably more like 5,000, I would guess, if you think of it like that. And we also have word images as well. So, and then you see the progress per week and how it compares to other courses. Okay, that's not great here this time. But <laughs> and then the different contributors as well. So, and our mentor is Vivi Saris, who's also in the audience, I saw. Yeah, she's great. And here we can also add updates, and you can also follow what's the news of each course that we have right here. So, yeah, okay, you can read this later. So we have our skill tree, and if you've studied on Duolingo, which I think half the hands went up when I asked that, um, you can see that we also have a gamified system for creating the course. So you can see here how many uh, sentences we've worked on that week. And a lot of us are here at the summit, so we're not um, <laughs> working right now. We were busy talking about Duolingo yesterday. And, um, but it's a nice comparison and an incentive every week to work on the course because you say, oh, that's zero. I don't want to be at zero. I want to. <laughs> like, oh, if I get 10 more sentences, I'll pass Jeremio. So, so it's the same, the same thing you see in the leaderboard in the regular course when you're studying. So I thought it was amazing when I came in here and I was like, wow, it's the same thing in here. So, and also for all time contributions you see as well. And the M marks the moderators. So, I will show you, you can live see a sentence being created. So, I'll choose Energio. And I can enter different forms of it. Maybe you can hold this while I type. Yep. So, <laughs> so Energio. I hope the internet works. Yes. Good. And there was much rejoicing. So, energioi, which means energies. Energion, which is the accusative tense, so like as a direct object. Oh, I don't need to explain that here. <laughs> Who hasn't learned a language with the accusative here? Okay. Energioin, so plural, plural accusative. And then. So I enter a sentence here. So, um, me, ne, and when I type a word, you'll see um, um, an example sentence that has also used it. Ne punis la hundidon kiam ji manjis lian sandwichon. He didn't punish the puppy when it ate his sandwich. <laughs> Very important les uh, sentences we have on Duolingo. Okay, so I see now that this uh, doesn't have a translation. So I can add a hint, which would be energy. Yeah, and I can also see the uh, hints for other words, like, yeah. Any more, any longer. And then I can also add more, or I can add multi-part hints, which means that I would say like, uh, mi ne is, I, well, mi ne havas would be, I do not have which I can add as a complete phrase if I wanted to, which is used more for like, say you have a saying like, bon um, tagon, so good day, and you can just make a multi-word hint. So, so who can translate this for me into English? Jack? Don't, don't have any more energy? I don't have any more energy? Yeah? yeah another, an alternate translation, I heard. And I can also say um, any is an optional word, any more energy. And yeah. So I could even add like. Hmm? What's that? I don't have any energy I do not have any energy. Any. Yeah, but I don't have any energy anymore. Yes. <laughs> So if it if it were a different kind of sentence, I could even add um, like I'm not gonna I'm just gonna show you how this works here. I'm not gonna actually add this, but I wait, I am not having any energy anymore. But in English, this is actually bad. But in other in other um, sentences, this would be useful. So you can set an alternative like 
both of them would be then correct. So, which is the best translation? Well, mine, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then after you have the translation, um, yeah. So when you have um, um, the contraction in English, then it always automatically um, accepts the others as well. Actually, I can even show that debug sentence. I don't have any energy any any more. Test. Any more should be together, yeah. Oh. Hmm? Mm. Oh, it means two different things. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, you see it turn green, which you, yeah, you'll see, you'll see it turn green eventually. <laughs> How do you add possible Esperanto translations for this sentence? Yeah. So, what uh, Esperanto translations can we have here? Because what's great about having 20, I think 25 percent of the audience can speak Esperanto, if I'm not mistaken. Where is that? Huh? Yeah. Is there any alternatives? <laughs> Ed, what do you think? Mine havas plu energion? Uh, mine havas energion plu, I think I would say. Mine havas energion plu. Well, this is great. I've never been able to live ask people for help on an incubator. This is wonderful. I should always edit the incubator like this. This is great. And if I have a question for my mentor, she's right there too. So this is wonderful. <laughs> yes? So question. What, what, what do you do in Esperanto, in the Esperanto course with the free word order? So would you uh, have energion me havas ne plu or something that's really unlikely? By someone, but it's still correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's correct. Yeah, yeah. So we, we type in the most natural ones. Yeah, yeah most natural so is you fine. Can never <laughs> the, the limit of 3,000. Not in Esperanto. I mean, it's it. I mean, we're lucky in Esperanto that most of the words don't have amb ambiguities. Yeah. So it's very. We're very lucky that way. So it's not Japanese. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's all we have here. So then I'm actually done. And let's see, I hope it's saved. Cause I'm not s Normally it would appear here. I think if I click here, it'll be, yeah, it'll refresh. Yep, there it is. So, you know, blue have us in our Gion. So for every, so you see here, we have uh, different lessons. This is the lesson on ideas. I'll show you the tree now that we had. And you'll notice just like you are learning on Duolingo, you see the golden eggs, you go down and see everything's golden. Yeah, of course, the golden toilet's always nice. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, and we've actually finished with everything except for ideas. So that's why we made I a sentence on ideas. On What's that? I was working on ideas. Okay. But I'm here now. Yeah. So, <laughs> me too. That's why I have to take up your Slack now. Like <laughs> oh, I love my team. So. Forty minutes after to finish this. Okay, we can do it. I love your help. It's great. Who, 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 does anyone want a presentation? Or you just I can just work here. If you want. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, in ideas, we have um, ten lessons. Um. And you can have, I think, up to ten or I nine uh, mm. words in a lesson. Yeah, so you have two to two to nine words in a lesson. Yes, we do have ingo. No, I mean the 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 Esperanto suffix ingo. Yes, yes, I said that. So here's affix is three. The affix is actually some of the hardest lessons to write, actually, because of. Um, Good idea. So the question was if we have the suffix ingo in the course, and here you can see all of our um, ag and <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Note this is the last affixes lesson, so this is when we're teaching the most obscure um, suffixes. So ex presidento, yeah. 
Nejero is a, yeah, Ero is like a tiny piece of something, so, and Nejo is snow, so Nejero is snowflake. And then we get into the really obscure things down here. Um, so we have Ingo, which is like a socket or a container. And then um, Kandalingo is a candlestick, which probably isn't taught in any other Zuolingo course, I'm guessing. But Cryoningo is a pencil holder, and Glavingo is a scabbard, or a uh, sword sheath. Because we just, to explain Ingo, there was just so few words we had available to us that are actually used. So. Electringo? Um, yeah, we had we had a debate in the team about Electringo. So. <laughs> okay. But anyway, I want to show that um, for each um, um, word, you want to have at least three sentences. Ideally, more than three sentences. And um, this way, you can keep reinforcing the words so that you uh, will learn them all properly. And also, when you're in phase one, You can even go and um, test your course. There's a button to test it. You can believe me. Mike. In the languages that use other writings, like other letters, mm -hmm. do you have any um, features supporting learning the new letters as well? So for the courses with other alphabets, we um, just have the first three lessons be, um, actually I can even show you some. Um, they will be, the first three lessons will be basically learning the letters and with examples. But uh, you're, you're, you don't work with transcription? Um, no, right? Yeah. Not yet. Our designers are working on challenges that will then probably change the way we would teach um, when we go through um, So our designers are working on challenges so that they will. <laughs> it's going to change. And then we'll okay. be able to start actually building courses that teach, you know, Asian languages or say Arabic or something. So that's a challenge. Okay, so we're working on another system to um, teach alphabets. But in the meantime, we have the system. So. Uh, just quickly about the um, history of making the Esperanto course, which might be interesting to you. When we first started, we actually got the template for Spanish to uh, work with, and we said, well, Spanish isn't the best language closest to Esperanto, so we think French is. So, and then they gave us the generic template. And like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> but, so I'd like to show you this, but let's see. Yeah, okay. Isn't that all so cute? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to pass this over to Daniela now, and um, she can talk about what it's like being in phase three when the course is already developed, uh, or the uh, course is already live, and it's a very, can, yeah, this one, yeah. One other thing that was fun in the Esperanto lesson was how many lessons we had to delete because they just weren't uh, applicable, like different verb tenses in English. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and even we decided to teach um, the past and future at the same time, which I think isn't in any other course. Because <laughs> past is east and future is os, and we, well, we just teach that in one lesson, that's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so I want to briefly show you uh, how the German course looks like. Um, it's basically the same as in phase one for this page. Uh, you can see the reports per 100 users. And um, it crashed. Maybe I can use yours. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Need to log in? Yep. Yeah. Sure. This is how you log out of Duolingo? <laughs> Uh, one other nice feature we have is that in um, each um, skill, you can also add tips and notes. So we can have, um, and actually in the Esperanto course, we have tips and notes in almost every lesson, even though the, it's not so necessary in such an easy, are oh, you back online? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Do you want to log in anyway? Okay. Yeah. But we also consider that somewhat supplementary because we assume you could even learn it without the tips and notes, but if you want a more in-depth look at the grammar or any particular points, then... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Then you can read the tips and notes as well. 
we really recommend people, even in the first tips and notes, we tell people, please try the lessons first and then read the tips and notes so that you have a better feel of the lessons, of the sentences coming up, and why these are important to you for learning. It's German, right? Should we switch it to your laptop? Yeah, let's try this one again. Sorry, <laughs> 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 Happens at every presentation, I think. <laughs> okay, so um, this is basically the same page. Um, you can see uh, how much we did and what updates we wrote. Um, the difference you can really see in the course, uh, we have the same uh, tree view, but here the um, golden color actually means that the skill is uh, good, and there are not that many reports. And the basic goal of this phase is to improve the course, make the course stable, uh, reduce the number of reports. Um, that's what you can see here. We get this figure of reports per 100 users. And our goal is to keep this as low as possible. And um, so the interesting thing, I guess, is you, if you go into a skill, for example, this is basics one, uh, you can look at all the reports that people send for the different sentences. And uh, here, this is quite nice. Actually, right now, it's only 200 reports. We actually cleared this a few days ago. <laughs> and um, for example, here is uh, eine Frau. Uh, and here you can see what people uh, suggested, for example. And um, here I would say it's quite clear that this is not correct. So in this case, I would um, say. Yeah, because they uh, can't see from the back. Oh, you can see it. Oh, yeah, here it is the woman instead of the woman. So, and here uh, it's a woman and a bread. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So in this case, I will click on uh, not accept. Well, the internet is not working, so in <laughs> normally this would then disappear. And um, so, and here we have also other types of reports. For example, we have free write reports um, where people can, um, yeah, well, write text, uh, what problem they have, or write a suggestion on what would be what should be accepted, and um, well, here here you can see a lot of people have problems with their microphone. <laughs> for this, <laughs> it's it's the first lesson, so it's it's uh, normal. Um, uh, then, um, so if you, but if you go further down the tree, things get actually more interesting because uh, the sentences get more complicated, and it's actually um, not that obvious what to accept and what not to accept. For example, um, here is the skill communication. And here you can see we currently have a lot of reports, maybe 7,000. <laughs> And um, so we are working on these uh, one by one. Like everyone has different strategies. Some people go top down or uh, from a button to top. And um, here you can see all the sentences with reports. <laughs> this is quite long. <laughs> and um, here on the right, you see uh, the sentence, uh, wir führen ein Gespräch. Uh, and it has the best translation, we have a conversation. Um, so um, here again, you could do the same thing. Here you see a uh, half is marked in red because the hint is missing. So here we could add a hint. And in this case, actually, I would add the multi-part hint because it's führen ein Gespräch. I would say it belongs together. So um, I would add a hint here, have a conversation. So, and if the internet is working, it should show up soon. <laughs> um, in any case, um, here you can again see the user suggested translations, and um, you can see people are suggesting a lot, and which is super awesome. <laughs> like we really everything they you can think of, people will re suggest and report. So, um, really, with with these, it's um, it's really a great help to making the possible translations more complete. Um, but Yes. Why do people type women on bread? I think they're joking there. Somebody's messing with the system? 
I don't know why people send these reports. <laughs> Either for all women on a bread, I think it's somebody's really messing up with the system. I don't know, maybe somebody just didn't see that they wrote an M instead of an N oh, or... Thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> There's a slow spelling mistake there. It's really somebody... Really, I mean, is it like some activity that you see that people are messing with the... Well, well, sometimes we get some jokes or some things that are obviously not serious, but uh, yeah, we get all time. <laughs> or something. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, in, in this case, um, like I, I just wanted to maybe um, make it more obvious, like. It's not always clear what to accept and what not to accept. For example, here we führen ein Gespräch. Like, who would accept we lead a conversation? Like, this is the top suggested translation here. 26 people suggested it. Like, who is for accepted? Wir führen ein Gespräch. We lead a conversation. Yes? Okay. I see the problem is that a lot of people like me learn uh, languages on the legal, but uh, they are not native English speakers. And I have much more problems with English than with language yeah. I learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I and, uh, yeah. So she said that she uh, had um, problems because uh, English isn't her native language, so she has more problems with English than with uh, the language she's trying to learn. Yes, so. and I don't, I, don't, I don't know whether it's... Uh, my translation <laughs> is good or not. Yes. Uh, so I always, when I learn, uh, I learn Italian uh, in English, and always when I translate from Italian to English, uh, and if my sentence in English is not accepted, I don't know whether it's my bad English or whether it's really possible to say like that in English. But uh, I, I'm not a native speaker, and I just cannot evaluate my English sentence correctly. <laughs> I'd say that's a very good reason why it's great that all of our courses, I think, have a, well, except maybe Esperanto doesn't have any native Esperanto speakers. Uh, quote, quote, I mean, I mean, I mean, okay, I know they exist. I know they exist. Uh, none on the team. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, none on the team. That's, that's, what, yeah, that's what I meant by the Esperanto team has no one on the team who has known Esperanto since his or her childhood. I know that very famous Esperantists exist, like um, George Soros who grew up speaking Esperanto. It's a very respect-worthy language. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, though, that um, our, our Norwegian team, for example, has um, a very healthy mix of, um, of native Norwegian speakers and native English speakers. At the moment, I'm the only native English speaker on the team. Uh, but it helps when you're a native to understand what is natural, what is almost natural, but grammatically correct, and just understanding those nuances, the synonyms, the ways of expressing things that would mean a good translation, a better translation, as opposed to um, a subpar translation. Well, yeah, and that's uh, exactly the case. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe another thing I can show you. Uh, we also have this workshop, so uh, where we have some uh, tools to, uh, for example, bulk edit. If we want to make a change to some word everywhere in the course, we can edit them uh, in a more easy way. Or we have report messages, which are actually very nice. Um, so, for example, if a lot of people suggest something that we don't want to accept, we can explain to people why, and then we, you will get a nice pop-up in your lesson if you type uh, this exact translation that we don't accept, and we won't get the report anymore. <laughs> and um, then we also have some language rules. For example, you can be uh, more strict to people who are learning French than to French native speakers. Um, and we can also see the contribution history. For example, um, if there's a new contributor on the team, uh, we can check what he or she is doing and then maybe give suggestions on what to improve or what to do differently. And um, yeah, and we also have uh, wikis uh, to um, like collect ideas or to organize our team. And here you can see we have a lot of pages. 
Uh, we have many uh, <laughs> tips and notes. Uh, we're writing them first year usually. Um, and we also have uh, already a lot of, uh, well, things we want to change. We have um, translation guidelines and um, yeah, basically everything we want to keep organized and write down somewhere. And yeah. That's for my part. Yeah, and then the uh, invites tab, which we unfortunately can't show you because that would have private information. We can also judge uh, candidates and see their um, applications. So. All right, so I open it up to the audience for questions. Okay, uh, pass the mic. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, how you choose uh, what words will be in course, uh, who chooses it, and uh, who chooses the initial tree, uh, what skills are in um, mind included, and uh, in what order? So, personally, from the Esperanto course, we um, a lot of what we use is the template that they give us, so we just translate what's on the template. But we also were using special frequency word lists that are, well, especially for Esperanto, this. this the Contacto, the cultural magazine, has a, a list of words that are used in that magazine for beginners. So we use that as a sort of a base to make sure those words are in the course. But it's mostly following the um, the template and just adding those words. Yeah. You the same? Or? Yeah, um, we were following, we had sort of the option when we were beginning the Norwegian tree, we already had Danish and Swedish um, that were incubated, or at least they were in beta at that time. Uh, we decided to go with the Swedish tree, but uh, of course there are they're not perfectly overlapping languages despite being mutually intelligible. So we had to make some executive decisions about um, which lessons to to axe and which lessons to create from from scratch. And um, it, the contributors have a great amount of freedom to build new lessons. Um, we have a philosophy lesson. We have a sea life lesson. And we have a um, a computers lesson that not many other no we not many other doing Duolingo courses have, um, but as far as the individual sentences go, um, those as as Chuck has has pointed out, those are creatively written by us and tried and of course sometimes they're they're very creative, <laughs> <laughs> they're famously creative, um, but it's it's part of the charm of Duolingo that we provide interesting sentences that that really try to approach the same words, the same vocabulary in a way that's a little bit more unique. And I also want to add on that, that uh, for example, the Esperanto course has a bonus lesson, Esperanto culture. Um, the Norwegian course has a Nynorsk, uh, Nynorsk <laughs> <laughs> a bonus lesson. And, and also in the um, Norwegian course, the very end is a, an entire skill in Norway. And same in the Irish course, there's one, maybe two, one or two skills on uh, Ireland. And so, which is also quite, so we have a lot of freedom in uh, exactly what we want to teach in the lessons. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Another question? Yeah. yeah. Um, how are you dealing with all the versions you are every minute um, uh, you guys are doing? Uh, are you making it like in Wikipedia or so that you can see which person when edited and then you can discuss with the person? Right. So right now you can only see who last edited a sentence? Oh, you can, well, there's two translations. There's the original English translation and the Esperanto. And you can see who last edited um, one half of that. So. Um, but, but it may, in theory, happen that you cannot um, restore something or what? Right. Okay. So, unfortunately. A little danger, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the incubator is also quite new. So, that's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When did it start, Myra? Can you pass uh, it back? A year and a half ago. Oh, a year and a half ago was when the incubator came out. Another question? Uh, hi. In the film you showed, uh, was the, 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 the main idea was to translate the web uh, <laughs> online, let's say, or, or mm -hmm. to, to have it in all possible languages. But now you create, uh, you create the, the courses, so it's the main idea of Duolingo or, or the basic. 
out of the game or it's just some separate uh, ideas now mm. uh, because so now you alone develop the, the courses. Yeah. You yeah. pass to Christine next to you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, there are three Duolingo staff members here. I'm one of them. Myra and Vivian. Um, we work on the community team. So that video is um, from around right when we launched. That was our launch video. And the idea was that as you were learning, you would be simultaneously translating the web. Um, so it was an experience that was integrated into the learner's experience as they went through the tree. And also there's an immersion view where if you're an advanced um, learner, then you can go in there and collaboratively translate articles from Wikipedia or people's personal blogs. Um, and a lot of people enjoy that experience because they get to practice and collaborate with others. Um, and so we've, um, as a company, our mission is free language education and more fair access. So we've also been expanding our ideas around that. Um, and one of the newest products we've created is uh, the Test Center, which is a TOEFL competitor, which is $20. You can take it from the comfort of your home. You download an app or go on the web. And um, that's another uh, place that we're spending our energy exploring is how can we have more uh, create products in the language learning sphere or education sphere that are uh, you know challenging the expensive offerings from other people and also making it possible for people to live out their dreams. Um, so does that kind of, what was your, does that answer more about where we're going and, okay. Yeah. And so, you guys uh, are doing an amazing job. It's actually, I, we feel very proud to be sitting here watching you do this, <laughs> an awesome presentation on um, contributing to the incubator. So continue. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I want to add with a, uh, just want to add quickly with the test center. One other thing that um, we use is the um, a webcam to test, like, to make sure that you're still uh, in the frame and uh, not looking off to the paper to the side, <laughs> for example. So, yeah, your second question? May, may, yeah, my second question. Do you plan also some course of Esperanto for intermediate? And uh, if yes, does the course now, for example, somehow correspond with the CEFR, so this common European framework for languages? Yeah, so um, we're currently working on the, the CERF, uh, CEFR <laughs> to um, comply with that so that you can see better um, where your level is. My personal guess is that with Esperanto you would reach B2, I think, is my guess. The course now? Yeah, I think. Well, when we com when we add like a few more lessons, but it's uh, yeah, uh, probably now it's like between B1 and B2, I'd say. But I think you hit a higher level in Esperanto than other languages because of the yeah, because <laughs> it's easier to learn, so you can fit a lot more language in because there's not so much grammar to teach. No. Do you want to expand on that or is it good? Okay. Other questions? Do we have time? I think. Five minutes? Okay. Answer a couple more then. Yeah. Uh, hello. What happens if someone actually applies for a Esperanto Klingon course, like for <laughs> developing the Esperanto Klingon course or something like very unlikely to happen, but someone does it mm -hmm. and he is or she is or they are the only person who does it? What happens if there's one volunteer, like a very motivated person or I don't know yeah. or two of them what happens so the, the time is that the um, the team at Duolingo actually decides which language pairs get uh, taught next based on the community um, rec demand and well, other features that yeah other reasons that are unknown to us <laughs> um, so in 2050 when they add the uh, Esperanto for Klingon course then <laughs> um, no seriously um, they really look at to see that there's a competent person to, to make the course. So if there would no, not be any competent people to make it, then they just wouldn't offer that course. But, I mean, it's not going to happen unless you have this rare combination like that. So One competent person would be enough. We also believe that... Um, pass the mic. <coughs> we, um, we actually don't start courses that have one person normally. Obviously, there might be an exception, but we believe that um, collaborating with others is a huge motivator in this project and building community and um, having people to bounce ideas off in chat and um, you see sort of the relationships and friendships that are formed um, right here 
Uh, so we so we try to create teams. We have the, we select the first two moderators who then and then we empower them to select their team members. Yeah, and actually, um, even at, when you're two moderators already, you can't add more moderators until you reach the twenty percent level, which I think is a very wise decision because it twenty percent gives you about enough time to understand the system to the point where you can also teach the system along because each course has one mentor and like for at least the Esperanto course we decided that I would mostly have the communication with the mentor just to keep the communication flow simple so I don't know if other courses are it's about the same with your courses I would say yeah yeah, yeah I um I was actually I was not um, an original moderator of the course I was selected at 20 percent and um it was yeah so most of the communication our course was small enough for the longest time we had three people very very introverted people <laughs> and so uh, our, yes it was very it was very um some would say characteristic of, of norway um but we of course we worked industriously um we whenever we had an issue our um vivian our our mentor was very very quick to respond um, whenever there's an issue in the incubator um, or some kind of a technical issue, there's a system that we use um, called user voice to actually um, vote up or vote down problems that are common, problems that we need to have addressed, and um, it's just an absolute pleasure to deal with. It's despite the fact that it's like it is work, of course, but it's um, it doesn't feel like it. I think maybe we have time for one more final question. I'm getting a nod that we can. Okay. Maybe it's a stupid question because it varies from language to language, but how long does it take, like roughly, to develop a complete course from nothing to launch it first time? So we actually have two good people for that question here. <laughs> um, so for us, we started in September, October, that's around then, and we expect to launch beginning of June. So I give you so yes, it's twelve nine months. That's <laughs> um, but uh, your experience is very different with the region. Yes. It's it's a little bit different when you're writing a course for a Scandinavian language, which is so close to English, and um, you have two completed Scandinavian languages to gain inspiration from. Our course actually. Um, all the sentences were translated. They still need to be reviewed heavily, but all the sentences were translated over a period of about 14 weeks, so a little bit over three months. Uh, that is lightning speed compared to most courses, if only because Norwegian is so relatively close to English. For, cl for languages that are farther away, it's just proportionately, it takes more time. And um, I think um, patience is a, is a very, very cornerstone virtue of, um, of people uh, awaiting these courses, and it's very important to keep in mind how easier Norwegian is to teach to English speakers than Ukrainian or Vietnamese. Um, it's just, it's impressive at any level, um, and we're so, so grateful for, for these contributors, to, especially for the difficult languages. Yeah, and I want to finish by also saying that um, when a course goes from phase one to phase two, a lot of the course gets locked, like the word selection, the skill tree, exactly. So we really want to make sure that everything is exactly like we want it before we launch it. So the people who are always saying, just launch it now! Like, <laughs> no, we want to make sure that we have quality before we go into beta. So, all right, so thank you very much. Thank you.